All right. Uh, so here's a little summary statement for number two. God ordains the free acts of men. There's the mystery. He ordains. What's he ordain? The free acts. Does he ordain them? Yes. Are they free? Yes. How can they be free if they're ordained? Uh, they are. Uh, how is it that God is not the author of evil? Uh, bo bottom line, he says he's not. I believe that's uh, Van Til's answer. He says he's not. Um, so, so and, and, and we've been looking at the crucifixion as the example of how God ordained, but is not, uh, you know, the, the evil of the crucifixion, uh, the trial, the execution, the judicial murder of Jesus. Um, he ordained it. Uh, but without being the author of evil. So th there's a separation between first cause and, and subsequent causation that removes any of the stain of, of sin from the actions of God. Yes? How do we square that with Amos 3, 6? Um, the Isaiah passage or the... Amos. No, Amos. Amos 3, 6. Let's read it. Um, I jotted down, I create calamity. Yeah. Which, which in the Hebrew was right. Ruan. Well, because it has a breadth, I think it's daring to use that word is what I said, but the word does have a breadth of meaning. Okay. Um, and so it can, it can refer to just natural calamities, uh, but, it, uh, and it can re refer to moral evil, both. So it's a daring use of the word, but, um, you know, the evil of the hurricane. Um, what influenced God to, to do uh, what he has done? Uh, just to look briefly, um, to paragraph three, the manifestation of his glory. Um, paragraph six, God hath appointed the elect unto glory so that he by, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, there it is. Par paragraph seven, is that where you're reading? I just went through all of them and just wrote them all down. One Basically, made it made one entire sentence. Right. So, so the point point here it is in paragraph seven, for the glory of His sovereign power. Um, uh, it's, uh, the paragraph eight. Uh, this doctrine it affords matter of praise and so forth. Uh, so ultimately, why does God do what He does? Not for some lesser end. Uh, not uh, ultimately for the good of humanity. Uh, collectively or the good of me individually, but for his own glory. Um, can his designs be altered? No. The confession says no. They're, the plans are eternal. Uh, do they need to be altered? No. Be, why? His plans are wise plans, good plans. Um, so um, they don't, they're not in need of alteration. Um, five, what... Um, what hint does the confession give to the order of the decrees and what difference does the order make? So here, here are the two... There could be a variety of <coughs> correct and orthodox answers to this question. Yes, Frankie is saying there, there are a variety of correct, orthodox answers to the question that could be given. Fair enough. And some of the smart people are super lapsarian. <laughs> a lot of the smartest ones are super lapsarian. Calvin is accused of being that, so there's some debate about that. Um, so what, what is at issue here in this discussion is, is the question of what was in the mind of God when he determined to save. So even as I phrase that, it might occur to you to think, what are we doing trying to figure out what went on in the mind of God. Or who has known the mind of Lord in his counsel? So let me just finish this thought. The, the, question, the, the question is, does God, in determining to save, contemplate humanity as created 
or humanity has fallen. So I want to be able to say, in spite of what a lot of the smart guys say, I want to be able to say that God chooses to save a numberless multitude out of the mass of fallen humanity. So that mercy is genuinely mercy. And I, I am resistant to the idea that, so all of this of course is happening, it's not, to, it's not happening in time. This is not an order of, of actions, this is an order of thoughts. This is, and, and, th and then God's thoughts are simultaneous to begin with. But the question is how does he contemplate? If he contemplates them as created, humanity as created, then he, he then elects in order to distinguish among unfallen persons those who will be saved and those who will be not. And so the critique, if you read your notes, which I assume that you did, is that, that then you end up with God creating some in order to damn them. Whereas when we say that he, he contemplates humanity as fallen, then we are fallen because of our own decisions, our own responsibility. We are sinners by nature, sinners by practice, to whom God owes nothing, to whom he is obligated to do nothing. A and yet he intervenes and sovereignly does save. And so that's what's at issue. And this is one of those many discussions about which maybe it's helpful to remind ourselves that it is the it is the uh, doctrines of the deviant that force us to take another step theologically, biblically, and, and to think about what is the, is that an accurate statement of things? Is that an accurate concept of things? So the, so the, the superlapsarians say one thing. Um, well, you know, I think they're saying it wrong, and that needs to be answered. So if they're saying that God is contemplating humanity as created, and, 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 and out of a guiltless humanity, he, guiltless, sinless humanity, created humanity, he's, he's saving some and not others, um, I think that needs to be answered. And that no, the order is not election. He's going to save some. Then he creates the, the, those, some, some of whom he is going to save and some he is going to damn. Then he ordains a fall, then he ordains to save. Whereas the infralapsarian is saying, no, God creates contemplates the creation, contemplates the fall, contemplates then choosing to save some out of the fallen mass of humanity. Ben. Out of curiosity, in your ministry experience, have you ever encountered someone yes. for whom this was a stumbling block of any sort? Or no. Is it, is more like no. No. And I almost always preach out of this, this perspective. I mean, I'm a, that is the perspective out of which I am always preaching and teaching. That, that, um, th yeah, that's why grace is amazing. So John Gershner famously once said that if God chooses to save a multitude that no one can number, or if God chooses to save a couple of dozen, or if God chooses to save just one, it's still amazing grace. Why? Because it's unob unobligated. Because, you know, he didn't provide a savior for the angels. Uh, the fallen angels, they're just, they're just damned. And there's, nothing, there's, no, there's no redemption for them. There's no savior for them. There's no escape for them. Um, but God in his grace is choosing to rescue a, a numberless multitude. He's saving um, the nations, the peoples of the earth. Um, and so uh, grace really is amazing because it's unobligated. It's not, it's not deserved, it's not merited, it's not owed. Um, God can choose absolutely to do nothing. Just like he says with Moses, with Israel, um, let me wipe out this people and just start over. Uh, at any moment he could do that. Yeah, yes. Uh, another way to put it is that uh, in order to be saved, if we're being saved from something, we, ha we have to have something to be saved from, which is what this model shows. But the superlapsarian is that we're being saved by something that we haven't, it hasn't happened yet. We, we you know, that, that we're, be, we're being saved when, when, before there's anything to be saved from, if that makes any sense. All it, of this is taking outside of time. But this is, yeah. this is only an argument problem. that Reformed Presbyterian by this problem. problem that we can have. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, I might lean towards super lapse area at some point when I speak about God and before the foundation of the world can be saved. 
right? But in the same language, I could turn around and say out of the ball and ask the Father God, you know, I might flip back and forth depending on how I'm communicating what I need to communicate. And I could then at the end of the day say, I'm agnostic. I don't know exactly where God was thinking. So I, I'm, I don't want you to retreat to thinking that because you think God chose you from the foundation of the world, it makes you a super lapsarian. It doesn't. No, 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 no. Right. So, so, so just okay. Saying, yeah. All right. So what, let me go back to this statement and let me, uh, let me quote the great Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. Um, so just bear with me for a minute. Warfield uh, points out that even to speak of a decree of salvation is of necessity already to consider humanity as sinful. Another way of putting the issue is, does God discriminate between people in order to save some, or does he save some in order to discriminate between people? Is the mode of salvation or discrimination? Here he says, it, um, is the, quote, proximate motive that moves him an abstract desire for discrimination, end quote, or, stay with, hang with this quote, is the proximate motive that moves an unwillingness that all mankind should perish in their sins. And therefore, in order to gratify the promptings of his compassion, he intervenes to rescue from their ruin and misery an innumerable multitude, which no man can number, as many as under the pressure of his sense of right, he can obtain the consent of his whole nature to relieve from the just penalties of their sin by an expedient in which his justice and mercy meet and kiss each other. <laughs> that is B.B. War, B. B. Warfield, Plan of Salvation, pages 20 through 21. And for those of you who are unmoved, Dabney says, quote, in my opinion, this is a question which never ought to have been raised. <laughs> His, and his, <laughs> Dabney's thinking is what, what's already been said is that God's decree is eternal, it's singular, it's not successive, it can't be parted out. That's, what, that's where Dabney is coming from. Sure. I think it's good. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Frankie, I think the Westminster Confession leans that direction. Uh, because of the singular use of the word, just as it argued for the singular use of just the singular use of the Trinity, it, you know, it makes the the uh, grammatical argument for the for the singular nature of God. And I think the it's decree, making the yeah. grammatical argument for the singular nature. Of the and, and just remember, all these these are these are not acts. This is all in the mind of God. So, we are yeah, and out. Acts of God in eternity. So it goes without saying that we are in very tenuous territory. If we were talking about nature of the acts, we would have to be super lapsarian. Because election took place before the foundation of the earth, then creation happened, then the fall happened, then redemption. Well, no, now see, you're back into time now. Well, the, no, that's what I'm saying. If, if we were talking about the Oh yeah, okay. Right, we're not talking about the acts. Right, right, okay. That if was a very important if. Yes. <laughs> All right. How, how does a person's uh, asking for forgiveness for, you know, for the different sins they do during their life, how does that affect, uh, does that wipe out the sins? Or, or so like we're just talking about their debt sins? Or, I'm not sure what you're asking, but our sins are forgiven at the point at which we ask for them to be forgiven. So, so the, the, the people who are so sinful are they're sinful because of, un, of, of sins that they haven't asked to have forgiven. Unacknowledged, unacknowledged, unacknowledged sins. I think you'd say that like when, when they repent and have faith, that is when that is like the proof of their election, which was not realized yet. And so they, yeah. they were even elect when they were, while they were living in sin, mm -hmm. but until, the, until they came to repentance, it was not actual yeah. yet for them. Yeah, and I think that's, if it's not being clarified and here. Again, you're parsing out 
the difference between what happens in God's eternal mind and what happens in, That's in time as, as, we're, as we're trapped in it. Yeah, I mean, it's making this point here, and it's, it's made, I think, when we look at um, justification. Um, you know, those, those who are elected are, are redeemed, effectually called, um, justified, adopted, sanctified. You're not saved because you're elect. Nobody is saved because they are elect. They are saved because election assures that they will come to Christ. All right, so Christ saves them. Election doesn't save them. It just ensures that you will be saved. And how will you be saved? You'll be saved by faith in Christ. That help? Dan, stop. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yes, but the question is, how do we conceive of God doing that? Uh, one is, a, is, is, a, is an active, an active, and, and active language is used for saving, and passive language is used for damnation. And, and so the, the language of the confession, um, I think, is an, is an attempt to try to make that distinction um, where is, uh, where is, um, part three. I think in, in part three where it says foreordained instead of predestined. Um, I'm looking for passed by. There it is. There it is, to pass by. So this is why I think it favors a superlapsarian scheme of things. Um, so you have, um, he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth for the glory of the sovereign power of his creatures to pass by. So that, that's the pass of the, that, that's the mass of fallen humanity. God is choosing and saving some. That's an active, efficient act. But with respect to the, the reprobate, he's just passing them by. He doesn't know them anything. He's just leaving them in their devices. He's leaving them to their own wishes. They are lovers of darkness, right? Jesus says, John 3, they love the darkness. He's just leaving them there to love the darkness. Go on, do your thing. Go your own way. So the, the, the passive language here is suited to an infralapsarian scheme that sees grace as being that which is expended, extended to the unworthy. Salvation is, is that which is given to those who do not deserve it, are not worthy of it, because of their sin. And so he, he, he reaches... Uh, we were just discussing again the Apostle Paul. You know, there was that group of people that were with him, that were journeying with him on the Damascus Road. We looked at this last Sunday. Uh, none of them understood anything from the voice and apparently weren't saved. God just decided to, to save Paul. And what about the ones who were around him? They weren't. He just let them go. They didn't understand what was happening. Uh, they, couldn't, they didn't understand the language. We're never told anything about them. Apparently, he just passed them by. Uh, did, he, he doesn't owe it to them. So that, that I, I, that's why I say I think that the infralapsarian view is, is a more biblical view. It has God leaving people. God gives Romans 1 language. God gave them over to their sin. He, he said, if, you, if that's what you want, go on. I'm through with you. And he gives them over to it. Um, and he moves on. He passes them by. Yes. So is this only really apply to Adam that Adam could have chosen the tree of life because everyone was born in sin so that they never really existed prior to their sinfulness like their whole existence was part of the cancerous lineage and so there was never an untainted version of any of us other than Right? Is that my? Yes. No. What's your question? So <laughs> it seemed like you were, you were that, 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 that there was like a million people in this premortal existence and they had yet to sin and then they were kicking out, you live, you die, you live, you die. But I don't think that's what you were saying. Um, because. 
I'm saying that God is contemplating the, the whole mass of humanity in eternity. And that's the reason why I have all this language of before the foundation of the world or from the foundation of the world, from all eternity, uh, working out the counsel of his will. Yes, he's contemplating humanity. He sees the whole of humanity and determines to s sees them fallen and chooses to rescue the multitude that no one can number. Yes? What's, so what's the reasoning, I guess, of, of these smartest people that you said uh, take this super lapse area? Yeah. What is their reasoning? They're just trying to act like they're smarter than everybody. <laughs> what about vessels created for destruction? That seems pretty active use of, of, yeah. of God's resources and his purpose. I think that the ultimately what the superlapsarians are trying to pro, uh, is to try to project is that there is one overarching reason for everything, and that is the glory of God. That is the overarching, and so everything falls under that category, uh, and um, um, and they think that the infralapsarian scheme waters that down, so that God's purpose is to save rather than just His glory. And it's just starkly his glory if he, if he just elects, determines to have a people, and then you know, a, a chooses some and not others, and then creates, and then determines to create, and so forth and so on. So that there, there's just a raw um, um, emphasis on the glory of God apart from any other consideration with the supra scheme. But in my view, in a way that, that uh, compromises grace, mercy, love, and so forth. Yes? You made a distinction between the acts and the mind. I think you said that those aren't two evil. Could you explain that one more time? I guess so what we're talking about is the decrees, which are purposes and plans that are in eternity. And, uh, um, and there's n that those are outside of time. They're in eternity. These are not the actions, whereas the actions are, are you know, they... they, they create time and there is a succession of events so that God then creates and then God uh, then the fall takes place and then uh, uh, then uh, God then chooses that he's going to save some and then he uh, determines that he's going to send a redeemer by which to save those some so that there, there is a there is a succession in time in these actions Jesus comes at a point in time as opposed to all this decree stuff, which was in the mind of God in eternity. So there's not any succession. It's, uh, it's all a comprehensive whole. Is that like the add intro and the add extra that we talked about for the attributes? Sort of, yeah. That's, this is the add intro, what's going, uh, add in, what's going on in the mind of God. The simplicity uh, of God applies here as well. <coughs> in the different ways you can argue it. Yeah. That's a, yeah. I think I have exhausted my knowledge of what's happening in the mind of God. <laughs> so, so let's go on to, uh, um, so the, the answer to number five, I think I, pr I pretty much have done that, uh, answered that as I see it. I, uh, what, what difference does it make? We can, we can understand salvation as a rescue operation. God delivering um, a fallen mass of humanity in the plan of redemption. The purpose of redemption is to rescue fallen humanity. Um, all right, what is, um, why has God chosen whom he has chosen and passed over whom he has passed over? Is, um, is, that, is that Passover language in five as well? Uh, regardless, the, the, what's the answer to that question? For his own glory, all the praise of the Lord. Yeah. 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 All, all to the praise of the glory of his grace. Um, six, <laughs> is it possible for one who is elect to be saved though he fails to come to faith? No, no, no. no, no. no so what happens in time uh, uh, is significant. So, uh, 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 you know, um, there, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, there can be a kind of abuse of Calvinism that we would call fatalism and sometimes goes by the name of hyper-Calvinism, which, which wants to put the, the decree of election out there 
to where it just reduces human response to irrelevance. And so that is being denied. Uh, th we are not saved by the, by the decree of election. It, 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 it determines who will be saved. But those who will be saved then must repent of their sins and come to faith in Christ. Um, let's see. Uh, it's sometimes said that we should not concern ourselves with complex theological matters such as these, to which practical doctrines... Does 3.8 relate predestination? Explain how the doctrine of predestination affects these practical matters. So 3.8 says, 16, 16, 17, there it is. The rest of, you know, the doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care. I trust we have followed the counsel of the Westminster Divines here this early evening. Have we handled this with special prudence and care that men attending to the will of God revealed in his word, revealed in his word? In other words, we're not trying to go past what the Bible says. And, and that's why we've spent so much time looking at individual passages. We're trying to be true to what God chooses to reveal, and he reveals this stuff, the, pre the predestination word, it's out there. Election, it's out there. So we're not trying, we're not trying to, you know, we're not, we're not now you know, slipping over into some kind of an abstract philosophy or speculative philosophy. We're trying to just, do with a, to just make sense out of and, and, and understand um, in, in, in a comprehensive way what God is, himself has revealed. Uh, attending to the will of God revealed his word and yielding obedience thereunto, in other words, believing what he says, may, from the certainty of their effectual vocation, be assured of their eternal election. So we'll have a whole chapter on assurance. If, you're, if you, you guys have to hang with it because that's like eight weeks from now. But we, we will have a chapter on that. So shall this doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God, and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. So, practical application. Assurance. 2 Peter 1.10 says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Make sure your calling and election. All right, so um, this is the knowledge of our election is supposed to be pursued so that we might, one, have assurance. I mean, that's the point of Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? This whole argument that we looked at earlier from predestination, those whom he predestined, he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. He then goes on and, and, and asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, you know, tribulation, shall peril, shall sword, and on and on he goes. And then he draw, draws the conclusion, no, uh, we are more than cr conquerors in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate any, but, but the whole series begins with predestination. So, assurance, why assurance? Because my salvation is not resting ultimately in my fickle decisions. I blow hot, I blow cold, I make up my mind, I change my mind. Um, does God change his mind? No, he doesn't change his mind. He is, he has, he is determined to have you, you are safe, you are secure. Nothing is, Jesus in John 6, 6 wait, the hand, in the hand, John 10? Yeah. 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 yeah, Jesus says, you know, we are in the Father's hand, and his, his hand, uh, and no one shall be able to pry us out of his hand. And so he envisions, Double wrapped, we're double wrapped in the hand of the Father and the hand of the Son. 
Uh, the point being, who's going to break that grip? Who's going to break the grip of omnipotence? Uh, so assurance um, is, is rooted, if it's, if, it's, if it's rooted in my decision, that's a pretty flimsy reed on which to rest. That's the point. It's not. It's not. Uh, I'm safe because God is omnipotent. I'm safe because God is omniscient. I'm safe because he's a refuge and strength and a fortress and a shield. Um, and uh, so nothing is going to be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ. So rather than predestination undermining assurance, it's meant to com um, compound it, to strengthen it, to, uh, to reassure us. Uh, praise. Uh, w well, you know, you know this... Uh, Ephesians 1, 4 and following to the end of that paragraph, that's all about praise. The whole thing is the, you know, the purpose, working all things after the counsel of his own will. In love he predestined us and so forth. The whole point there is it's all to the praise of the glory of his grace. It's all about praise. That when you consider this e eternal purpose of plan of God to save you and sanctify you and glorify you, it, it's all just a, 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 a hymn of praise as, as it were. Uh, likewise, Romans 11, you know, you get to the end of Romans 9 through 11, the whole thing is about predestination. You've got three chapters basically dedicated to that, and uh, when you get to the end of it, what does the Apostle Paul say at the end of all that? Oh, the depths of the riches and, and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. You find God to be unsearchable and ins inscrutable? Uh, how, how do you respond? You respond with praise. He's a big God. He, he just explodes the categories. He bursts out of the little boxes we want to put him in. He humbles us so that we just bow before the infinite one. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Uh, going back to that earlier question. I mean, who was advising him when he, you know, he put all this plan and purpose together and created all these things and governs all these things and redeems his people? Who's, who, has, no, who has been his counselor? Or who has given a, a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. So I would say personally, I wrote about this in the first chapter of uh, When Grace Comes Home. Uh, my whole idea of worship was utterly transformed when I began to understand the sovereignty of God. Just, uh, you know, it just, it just, a, just a much bigger, the, 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 the God of the Augustinian Calvinistic tradition is a big God. And we are little in comparison. So praise, um, reverence. Uh, this is why, you know, the kind of worship that we were doing was just son, so unappealing to me. It took some time, you know, it took some time. I think I, did I mention to this group, you know, I went to England thinking, taking my Maranatha songs and all that, to, that I was going to be the agent of transformation in England. And, um, and, and uh, you know, the praying with the prayer book and the, the, the deep com, uh, confessions of sin, that especially the communion confession, all that, just, uh, it just imparted to me a, a bigger view of God and, and, a, and just a demand for reverence. A, a sense of awe and wonder and reverence and fear, right, pr right pro you know, proper fear, not terror, but a proper filial fear of God uh, ha had to be a part of the worship, had to be well-ordered. There had to be depth, had to be substance. Uh, it couldn't be entertainment. No, it couldn't be entertaining any longer. Uh, couldn't be superficial. H had to be deep. Had to be reverent. Um, humility. Now, this ought to humble you. See, because I don't see how you can be a proud Augustinian. I don't see how you can be a proud Calvinist. About what do you have to boast? If you really do understand predestination, why did God choose the ones he cho chose? Um, Nothing in us, right? Nothing. I right? just think of thousands of dead bodies laying there, and he picked me out of all those dead bodies. How could you not yeah. praise him? Right, and, 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 and humility be the result. Right? How can you not be, you know, in other words, you can't think of yourself as superior to anyone else. It's not like 
you're, you, you are more virtuous. Anything that you have was given. What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you don't? You know, 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 3, 4, 4. Where exactly is that? 4, 4, and 5. What do you have that you didn't receive? I, I answer, it's nothing. What do you have to boast in? Nothing. You boast in the Lord. No one, no one else, nowhere else. <laughs> it helps to um, clarify our motivation for worship as well. You, you speak about spirit and truth and worship, and it, it, um, it moves us away from thinking, oh, I better go to church and show up for worship if I want to go to heaven, because I, I need to add up my good works a little bit more. Um, coming to terms with coming to terms with election and predestination should remove every bit of that and turn your, your coming to worship into true humble. Right. So, so the mo the motivation of praise, I mean, he is worthy to be praised. I want to praise him. I want you know this is this is the sense of things that I particularly have. Um, when we open the service with a great God-centered hymn of praise. Uh, when, you know, we sang this afternoon at the noon service, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. Uh, you know, and, that, and I really, really feel it on Easter Sunday when uh, the, they, they gather up in the balcony in the choir with the others sing the hallelujah chorus. I just feel like, you know what, at this moment, finally, God is getting the praise He deserves. Finally, it's happening. And, and the kind of a yearning that, that that day would come when the whole creation and all humanity would be joining in that, that, uh, that hallelujah. Uh, and why, why would you feel that way? Because that's what, that's what he's worthy of. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive all glory and honor and power. Uh, for thou hast created all things, and by thy will they existed and were created. That's Revelation 4. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to see that you receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and bless. They're worthy. They're worthy. It needs to happen. We want it to happen. We yearn for it to happen. Um, um, all right, time's up. We'll, uh, we'll come back to this next time, hopefully. <laughs>